We open with the Schubert fantasy for four hands. That relates to maybe most directly to Beethoven in this sort of... And he has the biggest presence on this program, for sure. Right, this un-Beethoven program where <laughs> we explore his influence without actually playing any of his music. Yes. I think forehand music gets this rap that it's like for the drawing room or for sight reading. Or for yeah, amateurs. it's it's like it, it's it's for fun hours for the performers and not so much of a of an important work. But it's very very stressful to perform. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, you're talking about that aspect. Yes. Beyond just the hands being on top of each other, interpretively, it's it's very uh, there's this wide emotional range, but at the same mm -hmm. time, it's really delicate. It has to be just. So, you know, and even collaborating with different instrumentalists as opposed to playing with another pianist, right? It, it we have an autonomy when we're the only person at the piano, but it, it's really trying to get into the, the ear of somebody else while you're playing with them. Mm. Uh, the Schubert itself is four movements interlinked with each other, one to the next, all with this sort of dotted, really, uh, rhythm and the main theme coming back mm -hmm. throughout to tie everything together, right? Kind of a style that, that Beethoven pioneered. Well, we have some solo works as well in the program that relate to Beethoven uh, in terms of uh, theme, but not nationality or anything like this. We have two American composers, mm -hmm. uh, John Crigliano and... And Charles Ives, both of whom quote Beethoven symphonies. Quite directly. Obviously, I mean, my, my toddler ran into the room and, and said, Beethoven, when I was practicing this <laughs> yesterday, so you will catch it. Right, so the work that you're performing is a movement of... A, yep, a movement of, of Ives's massive second sonata, um, the Concord Sonata, and each of the four movements is named after one of the transcendentalist writers uh, based in Concord, Massachusetts, and environs um, in the mid 19th century. So this one is called the Alcots. Um, Do we need to say what movement it quotes, or is it something that's better left for the I audience think, to figure out? I think out? you'll find out. Okay. But it, it depicts. You know, a family in, in this, what he called in 1920, these simpler times before newfangled technology uh, of, of Ives' lifetime, when people would sit around the piano and, and pick out different tunes. So there's lots of sort of cross currents throughout the piece that you hear as if multiple people are messing around on the piano at the same time. Nice. But then there's this like really glorious climax when everything builds up to this big C major quotation that you'll hear at the end. The Corigliano, John Corigliano work uh, that I'm performing is the Fantasia on an Ostinato, which was originally written for, as the commission piece for the Van Cliburn competition in 1985. And that piece, the quotation's a little less clear until the very end, which is the second movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. And he imitates certain techniques. He takes the, uh, what is that, Bebung of uh, Opus 110 Sonata, mm -hmm. and he turns it into this almost minimalistic repetition that goes on throughout the course of the work. Um, this piece probably reflects a little bit of Corigliano's mindset at the time. Uh, this was in the middle of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s where he lost so many friends he said he would stop at around 100, uh, which um, the dedicatee of this work is Sheldon Skolnick, I hope I'm saying that right, who was a really prominent pianist and uh, Corigliano's best friend who actually died a few years later of uh, HIV AIDS. And um, Corigliano's, you know, uh, pathos throughout this whole thing, you can almost kind of see that there's this heaviness that weighs throughout this entire work. It's not just Beethoven's Symphony, Symphony in name only, but also in heaviness and, and, and weight. Mm. And we've got a couple of early romantics on the program as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'll talk about the two Schubert leaders. Sure. Um, Beethoven, sort of mid to late in his life, pioneered this genre uh, called the song cycle um, with a, a piece called An die Ferne Geliebte to the, the distant or far away beloved, um, where there are, are songs that, that come back, there are a few in a row, they all connect together. Um, and this was one of Beethoven's many contributions to the whole romantic um, mindset, the whole aesthetic. Um, one of the composers who picked up on this new tradition of, of writing song cycles and, and art songs in general was Franz Schubert, who we mentioned before. Um, so I'll be playing two Schubert leader uh, songs, usually for voice and piano, arranged by another uh, huge Beethoven admirer and 
Um, the composer of the last work, if we're going to preview it. Yeah, <laughs> composer of the last work. Somebody who, who really tried to um, promote Beethoven's legacy and, and play the sonatas a lot in public, play some of the less familiar works, get people exposed to these really sort of difficult late Beethoven works that he would perform. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's Franz Liszt. Yeah. So uh, two of the pieces that I'll be playing are uh, uh, Der Müller und der Bach and Ungeduld, which is uh, the Miller and the Brook and Impatience. The solo work I'll be performing is by Clara Wieck, who would later be, uh, be known as Clara Schumann. Uh, this is a Nocturne, which is one of her Opus 6 uh, character pieces, um, musical moments or something like this. And this Nocturne, uh, while it sort of reflects this genre of early romantic right after Beethoven, writing of Chopin, for example, it does show that she has quite a mastery of craft and emotional content, even when writing this piece when she was 16 years old. Um, the last piece on the program is the uh, forehand version of Le Prelude by Franz Liszt, who we just talked about. And um, this arrangement actually was the version in which uh, this piece was first performed in the United States. Uh, it was actually hmm. performed first as a forehand work, um, where it got mixed reviews, but then is actually known as one of his most popular symphonic uh, poems, which he actually went to right after writing his massive piano sonata. I think he, he after writing the piano sonata and the second ballade, Liszt decided, I'm done with the piano for a little bit, I'm going to expand my horizons into the larger field of symphony writing, and uh, Le Preludes is the most popular one. Hmm. Yeah, and even in the forehand version, you hear all of these different orchestral colors, the mm -hmm. pizzicato strings, the horn melodies. And, and we and get a little bit of thematic transformation, right? Which his son-in-law stole a little bit later. <laughs> Wagner, that's yeah. right. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoy it.
Thank you.